My name's Chad Silwash. And this I'm is Joel Cheeseman. And we are a part of HR's most dangerous podcast. That's right. The Chad and Cheese Podcast. Yes, we're blowing up the uh, the podcast airways. Who listens to podcasts? Anyone? Anyone? Who listens to our podcasts? Dog. <laughs> Fail. <laughs> Fail. God, I heard Who will candy. be listening to our podcast? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, we're we're it's our mission in life to make make HR and HR technology talent acquisition cool. Uh, that's hard, man. It's, right. Uh, Lots but of beer for that. Lots of beer. Lots of beer. But today we have help, which is awesome. Uh, first joining us up on stage is co-founder of Working Not Working. Give it up for Justin Genac. Come on, bring it. The nicest New Yorker you'll ever meet, by the way. <laughs> he's a sweetheart. I cannot uh, believe he's from New York. That's nice. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, from Indeed.com. The CMO, you probably saw him yesterday, he's back for more. Paul Darcy, everybody. Late edition, he had to be on stage. Anybody from Indeed, they just have to be Paul on stage. Paul is also seeing a Black Sabbath cover band after this, yes. which is why he's rocking the black. Last but not least, the CEO founder, Chief bottle washer does everything at Communo, not to mention he throws this kick-ass party called The Gathering. Ryan Gill. <laughs> Can I get a quick applause for the conference and everything going on? Because <laughs> Kick ass. Let's do it. OK, real quick, and I mean quick, guys. Oh, by the way, before you start, because it's my party. Uh, <laughs> Four Americans and one Canadian, but we're drinking Molson Canadian. Hey, it's the, the Budweiser of the North. Yeah. yeah, if the Canadians buying beer, we're gonna drink whatever the Canadians got, right? So, Ryan, quick and dirty, give, give us a little bit about Camino. Yeah, so uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur, which is basically insane. Basically, that we're insane people. So I ran for. I was in the agency business for about 20 years, and the real simple thing is. AORs, for those that understand those, they're going away or they're gone. And so what used to be an asset to have hundreds of people uh, on staff is now becoming a liability because project work is up and down and up and down. It's hard to manage that as an agency owner. And so you can either complain about it or you can do something about it. So my business partner and I said, let's uh, solve something for ourselves. And we created a platform where uh, we could uh, hire talent contingently on demand that was vetted. and. Uh, the special thing about Communo is that it's a closed network. It's not open. So it's only for agencies and PR firms, digital firms, and creatives. So 43 disciplines from every, everything from uh, videographers to PR people to writers. And I'm um, having a blast. It's, it's hard. Startup life's hard. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's been fun. We've uh, been growing. And uh, I'm really honored to be on the stage with these two dudes <laughs> that I can learn a lot from because they went before me, so um, yeah, I'm I'm selfishly up here to learn myself. So nah. thank you, Genac. Tell uh, us about working, not working, not drinking, not drinking. That's our happy hour. But, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, a happy yeah. hour. They have a happy yeah, hour really called drinking, yeah. not drinking. The but, name was the best decision we ever made. It is they made awesome, all of our branding yeah. easy after yeah, that. Yeah. So uh, my background is in advertising as an art director and creative director, as well as my co-founder Adam. Uh, I spent years full time in advertising. I spent about five years freelancing. Finding freelance work was a pain in the ass. Hiring freelancers was a pain in the ass. So we created a community of the best creative talent in the universe. Um, we started primarily in advertising and design, but we've expanded to production, tech, um, and, and other tangential industries. And we made it really simple for creators to make a profile, uh, put their current freelance or full-time availability where they're working, available, available soon or full-time, uh, and they uh, get hired by clients that come on and have access to the entire platform. And for us, our mission is to eliminate the obstacles between creative people and opportunities. And so we're trying to figure out different ways to do that besides just getting people hired. But gotcha. that's the first step. And by the way, if you've ever elped yourself, uh, you have Justin to thank because he was the creative force yeah, behind that. Yeah, yeah. I'm so, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know all of your yeah. grandmothers sent it to and you. Mention uh, your podcast real quick. What's that? Mention your podcast. Oh, and I also have a podcast called Overshare where I, I interview creatives I admire about the struggles of being a creative. It's so good. It's you so can pass good. all those highlights in the perfect Instagram and talk about the real shit. Yeah. So yeah, check that out. Nice. Who doesn't know who Indeed is? <laughs> okay, great. We can skip Paul. <laughs> <laughs> who saw Paul yesterday? Nice. Oh, good. Very nice. Very nice. First question. 
Uh, I think we're talking about writing better classified ads for the newspapers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hello, Mitch yeah. is, yeah. yeah that's <laughs> um, let's talk remote workers, because we have two, two guys, at least on the panel, who deal with that. Um, Full-time work versus part-time contingent, uh, working remotely, different gigs. Like, what's, what's the trend that you guys are seeing? What, what's in store for the future? Uh, obviously, uh, how many people are here from the ad agency world? Got a good amount, uh, and like what Ryan was saying is the, you know, especially since we started seven years ago, the agency of record model is kind of going away. It's all going to project-based work, and you need the flexibility to be able to staff up and down. Um, so we've just seen a huge influx of people going freelance, um, as many people know, uh, and it's uh, it's definitely a competitive market. But uh, we're seeing a lot of clients that are, are are adapting to that and are willing to not feel like they own talent, like maybe we used to feel like we own talent when you hire someone full time and they're here and let's keep them locked in a cage. Um, it's about bringing the right people in for the right brief and, and having that flexibility. And, and I also, from my seven years of freelance, I thought it was like freelance or die. And then we sent the survey out to our creatives and we said for the right opportunity, would you take a full time job? Over 80% of people said yes. And so we we're like, oh shit. So we, <laughs> we, we added a full time status to the site and, and allowed people to uh, post and, and apply for full time jobs because it's just people are looking for the right thing right now, and I think we need to be open to that. And that you know things are changing, but they're people just want the right opportunity. Are you seeing companies bring employees in as as contract at first, and then to try to bring them full time? Yeah. Absolutely. Or is it more like we just have contracts all over the place? Well, because the really try looking. before you buy model is so much less risky. Because I'm sure anybody who's hired here has pulled someone out of another company, brought them into yours, and went. Oh shit! Yeah. <laughs> They're not as good as their portfolio. They're terrible under pressure. They don't get along with you know this person or that person. And so to bring someone into your culture, really see if they're a fit, and and it's great for both sides to be able to say, hey, is this the thing for me? And it allows you to go and sell. Uh, one of our recruiters, who's the head of recruitment, uh, Lauren Ranke at uh, Widen Portland, said that freelance is the new interview, and so they just use it as a way to bring people in and make sure that they're right before they go and commit to them long term. From postings, uh, Paul, what are you seeing on Indeed in terms of remote work versus sort of the traditional full-time? I, I mean, so after pay and location, flexibility is the most important yeah. thing for yeah. people looking for a job, and that's universal. Um, and we see different things in different parts of the world. Like there are places like Australia where casual employment, which is freelance and, and remote often, is an enormous part of the economy. Places like Germany where you see a lot of job sharing and other things. Um, the U.S. is farther behind. Um, we see a lot of searches for people looking for remote work, and we see a lot of people also wanting to optimize their life for happiness, <laughs> move somewhere that they want to live if they have skills that are in demand, and mm -hmm. find a way to support themselves in those places. Yeah. You know, this is one of those spots where you see that. So, Ryan, when it comes down to when it comes down to actually picking a niche, right? That, I mean, that's 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 where you live, right? And you've just felt you could take your expertise to the next level. Did you see that there was a huge need? I mean, why did you yeah. why did you jump in? Yeah, I built it for myself, right? I, I built okay. it. I, I was an agency guy for 20 years, and you get it's exciting for me, and I hope people see it soon. But I'm okay with the misunderstanding at the moment what it is because I was in the early days, 2000, selling websites, and people were like, sorry, what? Websites? We do CD-ROMs. Like, I get to, it's like, the, the web, websites are gonna be a big thing, this internet thing. It feels the same way with platforms now. People get it. It's actually nothing new. We, we've hired freelance talent. We've hired on-demand talent in person. These platforms, like amazing platforms like Indeed, and working, not working, um, it's just the way it should be, and so for me, the reason why I did it was for ourselves. It wasn't called communal at the start, it was called collective. And Chris and I had a goal of we didn't want to manage lots of people because it's a lot of stress. And then you start selling stuff uh, and selling your clients stuff. The, the people who win the most here are the clients. Because you start selling stuff to clients, you're a hammer looking for a nail. Like, okay, I gotta sell art direction, I gotta sell web development to this client even if they don't need it. Yeah. Or I gotta sell a you know a, a TV ad even though they don't need it because my staff didn't, I gotta yeah. pay them. And so that's bad. And so the contingent workforce and, and models like Working Not Work Indeed and platforms like ours, um, really I hope the agency owners out here um, get excited about it because it's not going to restrict, restrict them. It's like you really have it's like thousands a pipeline, of employees. Right? It's, right? Like yeah. a, it's like a direct and they're vetted pipeline. by their, they're vetted yeah. by other users. Yeah, they're they're vetted by us. We're we're a closed marketplace that vets them. And now we're adding an insurance product that if the person fucks up. 
Can we swear on this podcast? Sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> My wife's here, so she's probably like, oh, kids are going to see this. Um, if they uh, if the person doesn't do a good job, we, we'll, 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 we'll put doesn't a, perform. We'll, we'll put a uh, we'll give them a gold star and tell them no. Well, you can buy insurance on them. So the, I just love it's it's I love what you said it's like an orbits thing. You can do like insurance like yeah for you can your, buy. For your so if, if they screw up and it's like uh, Stephen here, I ask him to do a website for me and he screws it up, I can call customer service. So we have a great customer service team called Member Success, and you can work it out because sometimes he did screw up or you screwed up with a bad client, but we have a SWAT team that will come in and fix it. So it just, it's, it's, well, it's safer. I think the thing that you're talking about too is about being a benefit to the companies and to the agencies is bringing the right person in for the brief. Because right. a lot of times you don't have the right person sitting within your fault for well. So you're able to go and say, hey, we're doing deodorant, let's get someone that's worked on Old Spice, let's get someone that's done this and this, and bring in the experts on it. And then I have a lot of agencies that we, you know, we started with 95% agencies back in 2012. And some of them were super resistant to freelancers. They're like, no, we don't want to bring freelancers in. Uh, you know, it ruins our culture, blah, blah, blah. And, and they've all come around on it because they're like, it's actually great to be able to bring those folks in and infuse some energy. Uh, and a lot of times, uh, well, a friend of mine, Tim Gagan, said, if you want to find out what's wrong with your company, just hire a freelancer for a week, and it'll tell you everything that's wrong. Because, <laughs> like, freelancers, we go and do recon, and we're in here and here and here, and you're like, oh, shit, this place is very account person driven, or they don't care about the work, or the management is not paying attention. And, and you're able to really get a pulse very quickly if this place is successful or not and why. Um, so even if you just want to hire but if you do it, and if, do you, if you do it right too, you'll, you'll notice that you were, yeah. the line blurs, like when they're, so, when they're good and they're vetted and they understand how to work that way. Yeah. Most people on our platform will never go work for someone anymore. They want to be on their own. Yeah. Yeah, but there's no difference. I, I believe in next five years, there won't be us and them. Uh, it'll be natural and it'll yeah. be in there. And it'll I'll be a flow, yeah. Talk about bias for a second, and, and Paul, one of the things you, you mentioned yesterday that was interesting, those uh, job descriptions with more bullet points tend to skew out more women because they're more oh, cognizant yeah. of that. And I'm wondering if these sort of platforms skew a little bit younger because maybe, I mean, I think the myth is it's young people on these platforms and not sort of older workers. Is that myth true, or what are you guys seeing on that end? It, on our side, I, I, Indeed, they have a huge, you probably would have the data. I, I mean, our, the population on Indeed looks exactly like the global workforce. Yeah. I mean, we have a yeah. quarter of a billion people on the platform That's a month. Yeah. And so it's representative of people looking for work. It's all ages, all incomes, all types of work, all role types, all geographies. But is the assumption that maybe a creative workplace, like a work platform that you have, do you guys skew younger? Is that a myth? Well, we started uh, we started working out working by inviting the 300 best freelancers we knew in 2012. Your buddies, which was all, everybody we knew yeah. that was at our level, and those people now over seven years are, are running agencies and running companies, and so we were very top heavy. Like the joke was, working out working is a great place to find a freelancer for $2,000 a day. And you're like, well, that's not very helpful. Um, <laughs> and so we've definitely, we have, now we have students all the way up, but we do, we are, we have a lot at the top and some of the top people in the industry because uh, I think that's how we started and that really helped us get that range and then we're backfilling and yeah. getting junior and, and mid-level folks as well. Uh, so. uh, we, we, one of my exciting things, and, and Danny's here, our, our leader of member success, is we skew women. Like our, our, is different in the creative space because I have two daughters, first of all, and, uh, I want them to be powerful. I'm kind of upset right now there's not a woman on the stage. Um, I'm serious. It, 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 but on our platform, it's predominantly women. And I'm pumped for them because they don't have to climb the damn corporate ladder. They're, they have their own ladder. And they can go on merit. So how do you get there, though? I mean, because yeah, your, your platform skewing female. How did you do that? I, I don't know. I, I, think it, I think in advertising, we have a problem. And it's, it's been... It's been uh, documented in our, our media and our, our mainstream advertising media that it's, it was male dominated, but the females are more talented. That's what the, there's research that's come out, and they, but they get stifled, and so they say, "Fuck it, I'm going to go out on my own." And now they have platforms that they can uh, succeed on. And uh, there's a ga gal named Sabrina. She was one of our first members, and she went up against a bunch of agencies. And this is an amazing story. The Canada Games came up for bid, so all these agencies uh, pitched on it. Hope the ones that lost here. I'm going to be pissed about this. But she went in <laughs> and she was on her own. She had quit an agency. I'm going to go on my own and I'm going to be honest that I'm a communal member and I have thousands of people in my agency. Mm -hmm. And she named them and, who, and she won uh, a, a seven-figure deal. Wow. Um, and then she put it all through the platform. And 
she's a boss lady and she didn't need to answer to anyone. Yeah. She was able to use it through technology. And what would have to scale, I've scaled up companies like that before. That would have taken me three months. Mm -hmm. She's like, it took me three minutes. So, like, that's so speed. Yeah. we've like, been talking. I mean, we've been talking about those platforms and actually doing what you're talking about now is being able to just be fluid, yeah. right? You you just want a project. How in the hell do you staff this thing up and do it quick? And being able to 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 take a look at these different types of marketplace platforms uh, sounds like pretty much the key and not just the future of work, but if companies or agencies aren't doing that this way now, yep. then they're, they're already behind. Well, platforms are gonna eat the world. Let software eat the world, platforms are gonna eat the world now in the late 2000s. Um, and it's just the way work's gonna work. Yeah, we're starting and, to and see And indeed, that. and these people that went ahead <laughs> paved the way for us. We're starting to see the rise of the platform. So you see sites like Snag and Plated, yep. and even Uber and, and Lyft and others are, are platforms <laughs> yeah. like that. Particularly in the, in the retail set where I don't need to post a job for a server. I can have a platform that has a lot of servers. I can post an opportunity and they come in, they get vetted by whatever service that you're using. Do you think that is the future of sort of the part-time uh, hourly worker and will that bleed over in, into full-time employment as well? Paul, you can take that. You can warn this. <laughs> will know. I be a doctor working at multiple you know, hospitals whenever I want to work in the future? I don't know. I mean, I think that there are areas where this change is really rapid, and the yeah. creative industry is one of them. And you know, even in, in our marketing team, the creative model that we have is a mix of agency, freelance, and in-house, and we're pretty much agnostic on that. We'll let people, great creative people, work with us however we want. Yeah. You know, my technical teams or other teams don't work that way at all, and I, I think that when we look at work, um, especially in the US and Canada, it's still relatively structured. The unit of currency is the full-time job, and change is slow. The gig economy is incredibly visible. It's still a small portion yeah. of the, the workforce, and it's growing, and it is transformative. Um, but uh, for a lot of organizations, it's really tough to make that shift to different sorts of working models. You know, it impacts the culture, the way they operate. Um, and we don't see it changing as, as, as fast as probably the world needs it to. Uh, but I, also, I, I think there will be portfolio careers. That's a new trend word, and if you haven't heard before, <laughs> Google it. Portfolio careers are awesome because getting fired <laughs> sucks when you have three kids and you don't have another job. And I think it puts the power back, in, in, especially we're in a product is the people in the advertising marketing world. And so why work for one company and be screwed when they let you go? Um, have if you, if it's like running an agency. You don't want to have a client that's more than 25% or 20% of your P&L um, for your career and your life. It just yeah. makes sense. It's exciting because it, I, 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 it's like for me, if everything goes tits up, um, that's not a great thing to say. To <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll go on Communo and I'll, I believe in myself and I can have five or six or ten different jobs at companies well, and I do think, different I things. I think for all of this, it's the same as it's always been. It's about relationships. Yep. So recruitment, every good recruiter I've ever known has had their a bunch of relationships with talent and the relationship straight out of school and nurture those relationships over the years even if it didn't come to fruition or higher initially. Yeah. And I think this is just giving people access to more people and more relationships and, and really building those uh, in, in a real way because I don't, I, I don't want to be just someone like, it's really important for us on working on working not to be transactional. Mm -hmm. It's membership based and it's bringing yeah. people in and, and bringing people together in real life because this is real shit and this is real human connection and to go and just say like, oh, I'm bringing, like we don't go and have a buy now button. Yeah. You have to talk to the person and see if this is a good fit and if you really wanna hire them. And so it's the same thing we've all always been doing and it's just giving people better tools to access those folks. Well, this sounds, I mean, this sounds like it's giving the power back to the candidate. So we all know about regulations like GDPR, yeah. Canada's gonna go crazy and go even more strict, uh, or not Canada, sorry. My bad, yep. California, uh -huh. um, in 2020. So it's all about being able to give the candidate their data, control of their data back, and really control of wh what they do and where they go. When you're a part of the community, I mean, you are controlling everything, yeah. Yeah. right? Well, like when I, when I got out of school back in 2002, advertising was the only place I knew to get a job as a creative weirdo and then can actually get paid. Um, and now those opportunities are far beyond ad agencies. There's such, even in the past five years, there's been such a shift culturally with the importance of design and creativity in brands and companies, and brands are seeing the value in that. Yeah. Like my mom got a different cell phone because she didn't like the user experience. 
And the fact that my mom has a standard of what she expects for user experience now in her <laughs> smartphone <laughs> is, is a total shift because of companies like Apple and Airbnb. And so people and brands are seeing the importance of bringing creativity, especially at the C level and bringing those people in. So now I'm getting opportunities and creative people are getting opportunities everywhere. And I just think there's just more priority on what we're doing. And obviously everyone knows there's more competition for your talent. Um, but yeah, we, we talked about this yesterday. Like you're not losing talent to Google because of free lunch. It's like you're losing it because <laughs> people want to be, be in an environment where they do, can do the best work of their career. And it's really our job and, and everyone in this room's job to create those atmospheres to make that happen. Yeah. Paul, one of the things that stood out uh, for me in your presentation was you talked about job descriptions and how important thinking of those as, as a creative outlet other than just a, a, you know, a utility was important. And as you had the two different jobs up, one with a really poor job description and one with what you thought was a really good job description, I noticed that both of them had about the same number of stars on their reviews. I think they both had a four star review. So I instinctively said, I don't really give a damn about the job description. If it says it's a good place to work, then that's going to that's gonna trump anything that's in a job description. So um, would you agree with that? And then secondly, you see a lot of companies with profile pages, with bad star reviews. I'm sure they're doing everything they can to get them up. What advice would you give them and what creative things are you seeing companies do to get those, those stars up? So on the job descriptions, um, so, so first of all, the, the, this is an area we talked about yesterday and I've been doing a whole bunch of research on. Uh, and one of the things that we wanted to figure out is how, what leads someone to pick the place that they wind up working. Mm -hmm. um, when people buy things, we know that they start with a consideration set, and the things that are in that consideration set, they're much more likely to choose, two yeah, to one. Sure. Um, but it turns out that when people look for a job, it's not like that at all. About one in five people start by saying, I want to work at one of these companies, and I'm going to start my search there. Four out of five times, they don't. And only 14% of people say they wouldn't consider a job at a company they've never heard of, which is insane. Like, that's a pretty amazing thing. People have a really wide lens on what they're open for for careers. But what does matter to them is pay, location, um, that they're doing meaningful work, um, that they have opportunity, that it's a community that they feel like they want to belong in. Job descriptions suck. They are so bad, mm -hmm. the way they are written by most organizations. Mm -hmm. And when you read a job description, and we looked at a couple of them yesterday, even though you don't think it, the number of messages you take away from that are remarkable. Like, you know, people read between the lines and say, these people are boring, or they're all in it for themselves, or they don't treat people well, or mm -hmm. this is not a culture I want to be part of. But it's all because people are saying, I need someone who checks these, all of these boxes, um, and they do nothing to explain what's in it for the candidate Data. and why yeah. this role in this place is special. Getting your job descriptions great and telling a story of why the work is meaningful, why the place is special, what the community is like that you're joining is like the most powerful thing you can do to improve your hiring. But don't yeah. you think if I have a one-star <laughs> review and have the best job description ever that yeah. someone would look, look at that and say, yeah. Stay yeah. away. No, and it's hard, you know. It, but I, can is, I jump in there? Yeah, go ahead. Because I, I, I have an issue with that. Because I think it's it's broken. There, we, we're, we're living in Amazon 1999. I think reviews need to change. Mm -hmm. uh, Danny and our team are working on emoticon review. Like, it's just so unfair. Like, because so, they might, to his point, it's like, they, they might have a one-star rating, but maybe they were right in there. It's just so faceless. I think, I don't know, it, that's my well, take, I think it's even like but the, the rating yeah. system needs to change. Well, even like just being able to talk to somebody that works there or has worked there recently and making those connections happen, because most of the jobs I've been excited about, someone told me about or I knew someone that worked there, I can yeah. go and say, oh yeah, that agency, I'm like, I haven't really heard all that much, but then I look up and a couple of my friends had worked there and, and I go and talk to them about it, because this is a human decision. <laughs> and yeah, the reviews and all that, it just gets too, too data focused and we need to be more people focused. So if a company came to all three, I don't know, maybe you didn't answer, but you yeah. guys and, and said, God, I've got a one star review, like what, what do I do, do to improve my workforce? Would you just say, I don't worry about it? I would just would that take, be your answer take to that them? shit down and we'll find another way to solve the problem. You know, I, I, and it all depends on who you're trying to attract, right? If you're trying to go after thousands of people, then you need to have that publicly facing, but there's other ways to approach the it's problem. De it's definitely on them. One, yeah. it, my, my take is on, it still is on them. Um, I loved uh, Jonathan Mildenhall, who was, was the CMO of Airbnb a couple years ago, was here. And then Douglas kind of talked about it, that we're trying to teach our members, don't do five star, what's six star look like? 
Yeah. It's, you can't, what's seven star? star? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you pick them up in a helicopter and you, yeah, yeah. and like, you know, you signed your <laughs> contract in a gold uh, ink or something. It's like, <laughs> I, I, that's funny, but I want to teach our members yeah. that, that it's still customer service. And the fastest way to do out of business is give bad customer service. And you're a business even though you're one person. So start acting like it. And I think if the gig economy is going to work, it does will fall on people, and it's the ultimate meritocracy. Well, it sounds yeah. it sounds like Douglas though. It sounds like he actually had hands in the actual job descriptions themselves, yeah. and it's like brand. And this is amazing. where I think this yeah. is where I think They're brand is really broken. We are touching everything on the consumer side, but we don't realize that job seekers are also consumers. And if you take a look at uh, there's a there's a great Virgin uh, Media. Uh, case study that's out there where they they actually saw that they lost six million dollars due to their user experience and they had an opportunity to prospectively gain that back obviously with a better user experience but that's brand right not to mention they could have gained another seven million on top of that so a net 13 million if they just treated their people right and yeah. they didn't have such a fucked up process. Well, we did a, we do a survey every year of our community and it's just an open form field they can put whatever they want what's yeah. the one place you'd kill the work uh, and now we, we've opened up to three places and we release a, a list every year and this is the first year uh, we release them in order. But every week we ask a, a weekly question to our community of 65,000 creatives and one of the questions was, uh, does the recent Nike Colin Kaepernick ad make you more or less likely to want to take a job at Nike? 74% of creatives said they made them more likely to want to take a job at Nike. Yeah. Amazing. We That's sent awesome the same stuff. question to recruiters yeah. on the site. 77% of them it made them more likely to want to take a job at, at Nike as well. So the, the work that you're putting out into the world, it's it's all encompassing and helping the recruitment job, which I'm sure many of you It's like the done. new Gillette ad though too, right? Yeah. I mean, really that brand reaching out and is that a, the type of organization that you want to work for? I, I have daughters, right? Yeah. That may, I mean, like the Audi commercial that we talk about, Super Bowl, man, it like kind of makes me tear up a little bit, you know? Yeah. It's like that is, that's where I want to be. Well, that's I where think, I want my kid to work. I think it's know? a law of attraction too. Like I want to do work personally as a creative that makes jobs come to me. And it's what I always advocate to friends of mine, just put great work out in the, into the world and see what comes to you. That's the type of opportunities you want. You don't want to be job searching. And I think the same thing for companies. You want to be putting your, planting your flag and letting the right people come to you. And that's why like so many brands that are purpose driven are having an easier time recruiting talent because they're, I know why I'm coming there. A lot of times ad agencies, I don't know what differentiates them or what they believe in. You put like a bunch of ad agencies, websites and mission statements on a wall and they're interchangeable. And I think very few of them do that well. And I think if you're able to articulate what makes you different and why people should give a shit, then you're gonna be able to have a much easier time recruiting talent and then it also reflects in the work that you're putting out. I think it's interesting you said that you surveyed your users and recruiters. Yeah. Uh, we had, uh, 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 head of HR from SurveyMonkey um, on our podcast recently, mm -hmm. and she talked about companies always surveying not only workers but job seekers, and you know, survey the interview. How did how did it go? Do you guys agree with sort of ongoing surveying and and how to do that? Do you have examples of companies that are doing it creatively, or any comments about sort of always checking the pulse of your workforce? I mean, we do for our employees regular engagement surveys. Obviously, we look at our reviews uh, on Indeed and Glassdoor. We um, do a ton of research um, in the world as just a continuous um, part of the way we do business to understand what's happening in the world around us. Um, all of that is, is really, really good. One thing, too, I think that for, you know, for shaping, building a great employer brand and, and being a place that people want to work, mm -hmm. um, I think it does start with having a real pulse on what is special to your employees, what gets people to choose you and to stay with you. Yeah. Um, that research, just like you would do in any other brand work, um, is really key, but it's often missing. Um, people go too aspirational in a way that's not authentic to who the organization is, and mm -hmm. it, it doesn't, it works against them when, when people join. I, am I, that's so true. <laughs> um, my point of view on surveys, because we're only a year and a half old, so these guys are like grandpas compared to me. On, uh, <laughs> and in a, in a positive way, you have experience that we yeah, don't yeah. have. Um, so I'll speak real talk to any startup people here. I'm like, survey, oh no, because like 60% of people are going to have problems. <laughs> and so like, and, but we got to do it and we got to hear it. And we just have two rules at Communo. Um, when we get, we want critical feedback, we, we need it to become better. Mm -hmm. um, so we want that, but the rules are, if the person giving the feedback actually cares and wants to make us better, they're a real community member. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and they can be hard. They can be harsh, but do you care? And then my second one for me is, have they been in the ring before? Brene Brown talks about it. It's like, it's, mm -hmm. you can't take feedback from everyone. Look, I'm a human. Pinch me. Like, it, it hurts. It's, I'm trying our best. We're spending millions of dollars building this platform, raising funds. It's hard work. I know my team is working so hard. And so when, this is a kind of off topic. When we send out surveys, I cringe. I'm like, oh, shit, because we're going to have to eat humble pie here. Mm -hmm. But it's OK to eat if those two criteria are filled, because you know that community just really wants to make it better. And yeah. Hearing Airbnb again, the, the, it, we all love them today, but they went through so much shit. Yeah. It's so easy to call them an overnight success, but yeah. they were like us one day. And I'm sure I'd love yeah. to hear in the early days of Indeed, like you just messed stuff up. So every time Danny sends out or Patrick sends out a, a survey, I'm like, okay, I better clear my schedule for a couple of days. <laughs> um, because you're going to cry. But yeah. I, at the same time, for any entrepreneurs out there, don't be afraid to say thank you, but I'm not interested in your feedback because they don't pass those two things and say, here's your money back, please leave our community because those people are not acting in the best interest of the community mm -hmm. and I have no time for them because they're going to distract from the people that really care and you can't build for everyone. I think it's really easy to bullshit ourselves yep. uh, and bullshit ourselves of who we are as a company, what we believe in, and then you go and start asking people and you're like, well, we think that <laughs> totally. because you know, I, I'm terrible at interviewing people. I'm just like the hype man. Uh, I'll just be like, yeah, this is our mission. It's what we believe in and this and that. And then like, they're like, well, what'd you think about like their skills and stuff? I'm like, oh, I forgot to talk about that. <laughs> you know, I talk about what they're passionate about and all that, but I like, can they do the job? I don't know, I'm not the person to figure that out. But I think it's, uh, <laughs> and, and now I know that. Um, but I think it's really important that we, we have a really honest gauge of who we are as companies and what kind of experience we're providing for our members. So yeah. surveys may be one thing, and maybe just talking to our users. Airbnb yeah. did Airbnb open. I don't know if you yeah. were at the yeah. talk, and they had that, mm -hmm. that thing. We have communal mayors. One of the mayors of Vancouver's here. I think our mayor of King. We, have, we call them mayors because they, they believe in it more than us. And we don't, hope we'll still do our surveys. <laughs> but we don't need to because they're telling us, and we trust yeah. them to be like, you guys, this is horrible. Or keep doing this. and so. Um, that's not scalable, but they say in startups, do stuff that's not scalable at the beginning, yeah. and you'll lay the groundwork. So talking uh, to people, I think is scalable. Yeah. You know, like listening to people is scalable. Yeah. Um, it's just a matter of like, uh, you know, who, who's filtering the responses. Wait, how do you guys do a survey for that many people? So internally, yeah. yeah so we have about eight, <coughs> we have about well internally. I mean, we have about eight thousand employees, sure. um, and so we do pulses on engagement. We do them a couple times a year. Um, different departments choose whether or not they're transparent or not. In my department, we do it actually transparent so that we know who's giving the feedback. That's the best. Um, I, yeah. I love that, actually, because first of all, I mean, there needs to be trust to get Courage. good feedback, but um, it's really, you, you hear things and people tell you things that you need to deal with and being able to go talk to that person and either fix the situation um, or understand what's going on is really critical to making things better. It's so easy to ignore that stuff, yeah. Yeah, um, and you worry in that, that because people's name is attached to it, that they might be scared to tell you the things that you want them to tell you, but you've got to build the trust for that. We've got less than 10 minutes. If you guys have questions, raise your hand. We've got somebody over here. We're just going to keep talking. Uh, next question for me. Um, so on the AI chatbot side of the house, right, and when we're seeing all this awesome tech that's popping out all over the place, um, do you guys, do you see that those chatbot, do you see that as noise or do you see that as the opportunity to really amp up your process and as Ryan said, scale? Yep, I, I, I have big thoughts on that. I, I haven't seen AI. And IBM will even tell you. We're partnered with Watson here. Mm -hmm. I would say that Watson's the leading global leader in this. They were early in it. And I, I mean, I've been at the headquarters, and it's still early days for them. They're the best. So I like to use, and I'm not, I'm not a technical founder, but we have some amazing technical people at the company. I think machine learning is, learning is the better word. Mm -hmm. I hope AI comes, and, it, and it, it will, and I'm uh, unqualified to talk about it. But we got to lean into it. Uh, when it comes to chatbot, I, it reminds me of the early days of search. Mm. Kind of annoying, doesn't pull up the right stuff, yeah. but it's going in the right direction. Ah. And I think it, it, it expands our capability. Uh, for sure, Paul, you can't have that many people on your thing and not have AI or machine learning. So my take on it is it's very early days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I tell my team, like, we're small enough, like, take the calls, take the thing. But like, we, we, we use uh, intercom 
had no idea how great that product was until we started using it. So if any, anybody what uses it? Intercom, it's basically a little chat bubble in the corner, but it gives you all sorts of insights. Uh, but they have like bot chat bots now, yeah. and we just use it as the start. Let's just get a little bit of information, one or two questions to point people in the right direction to be the right person to talk to. And it, you know, it's like a, a you know a chat way of doing the old like phone decision tree. Um, but we're not using it for anything. We're not going to fake that we're a person. Yeah. But let's just try to get someone uh, where they need to go quicker, just to be a little bit more efficient. Well, job seekers, there's actual survey that says job seekers don't give a shit whether it's a, a bot or not. They right. just want interaction, yeah. Yeah. right? Because they go into a black hole. And they want feed. They want feedback. They yeah. want to know that someone saw their yep. shit. Because it sucks to go and apply for a bunch of jobs and have no idea if anybody ever saw yeah, it. Is all this stuff I'm doing worthwhile? And so giving some sort of feedback on that is definitely necessary. Cool. We have a question. Yeah, good question. Um, so, universally accept the fact that you know culture is, is a very powerful mechanism within an organization. I also accept the fact on platform and you know gig economy as far as being a part of like, making for organizations going to go. But I have a real challenge in trying to get platform and culture to work together. I, I can talk to that, and we're trying to. That's a huge question. I walked away from, or more like investors walked away from me. <laughs> um, I like to say I walked away from them. <laughs> they walked away from hey, me. Hey, it's your story. You tell me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I don't know if this will work. We're holding our breath on it, but co-working's hot right now, and so culture, even though you're a technical platform and a digital platform, we have uh, co-working spaces. So uh, we opened them up once we hit a tipping point in a city. We're going to Toronto in April, I think New York by the end of the year, um, and we're opening up co-working spaces for small, medium-sized, even larger agencies to come in because although it's a platform, it's still a community, and you cannot... You heard the stories, like Airbnb's the poster child. They did it on a platform and they built culture, not just in their company, but their hosts and the users. So it can be done, but IRL in real life yeah. is so important. Well, you need and to have, it's hard. Yeah, you need to have leaders of that culture that can help disseminate that. And your, your Airbnb go from 150 to 2,000. Like our team's only nine people. Um, but even like, bring, especially bringing in freelancers, it's like you need to have someone that's able to articulate what we are and what we're all about mm -hmm. and, and throw some guide rules or if it's a brand book or whatever it is, what are the things that you want to make sure people know when they walk in the door so they have an understanding what you're all about and then can very quickly get on board and up to speed. Um, because yeah, if you're just bringing people in willy nilly and then not really telling them who you are and what, how you do things, then they're going to be lost and it's just going to be really fragmented. So it's just about communication really. About broad space. I mean, because we know, again, the application process sucks, right? And from a culture platform standpoint, you want it to be, the user experience has to be great. So what is Indeed doing to be able to, and what are you seeing in, in the market overall to see huge advancements, or are we? In the, like, apply process? Yeah, or in that? yeah, yeah. Just yeah. the user experience overall. Yeah, it, so, well, I mean, user experience is incredibly important. I mean, yeah. we today have 500 active tests on Indeed. You know, everyone's experience is a little different, mm -hmm. and that tells us exactly which is better, and we are continually evolving and tweaking, making, you know, hundreds and hundreds of changes. I'm so jealous. Um, that's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm like, we have five um, tests going on. <laughs> so, so, I mean, so, I mean, you know, for us, um, there's two ends to that. One is is understanding the people that we serve yeah. and um, how we create a human experience for yeah. them that supports them through job search. Job search is a really lonely process, and so the human side of that's incredibly important. You know, my marketing team has you know three pillars. It has brand acquisition and experience, and experience is as big as anything else. And experience and UX work really closely together mm. on that sort of work with our with our product teams. But the other end of that is continuous optimization to make sure that it's working and effective. And what we find which is reflected in Indeed, is that simplification always makes things better. I think it's also really important to communicate with your peers. Yeah. Um, it gets really lonely, especially if you're freelance. I spend years working at home in a home office. And um, so one thing that I've started doing is a creative support group. Um, so I started in New York with 30 seats in a circle and just talking about what we're struggling with right now. And it may be searching for work. It may be the downtime in between gigs. And, and just talking to other people and knowing other people are going through the same thing makes you feel so much better about your, 
your own struggles. And so I think it's really just leaning on your own personal community and other communities that are being fostered and created. Oh. So you, you feel like less alone and you get tips and advice from each other. Now, there's, we have a huge obligation within the application process and making those connections to make that even more human. Mm -hmm. But I think also just talking to people and not acting like we have all this shit figured out and we're like hustling, 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 killing, killing, killing it. Because that's not really true for any of us. Well, in agencies, I don't know if you live in this world, if you're marketing, so you probably are connected to lots of them. It's usually been a zero-sum game, like I win, you lose. And we're finding in community, we're probably working, not working, it's like this community of we want you to win first. And we need to display, I, I invited Justin here, phoned him, and could be considered a competitor. I don't see that at all. I want all the community members to go on his site. I mean that, I'm not saying that because it's the right thing to do. But we're both trying to figure it out. And we hit yeah. it off on the phone, I met his team at South by Southwest, and they had the same spirit of it. So at a higher level culture, just platforms in general, uh, I think why eBay and Amazon, they all won. They didn't actually fight each other. They were like, hey, we should help each other. And I just hope, uh, and I, I hope this is a, the spirit of us, us two being on stage, that we're not fighting each other. I'd like yeah. to see multi-tenanted. And what I mean by that is you're on a communal platform, but you're also on working, not working, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's yeah. cool. So you talk about competition. And, and there are 800,000 pound gorillas that are now in the space, yeah. Google is in the space. Yeah, scary. Uh, Microsoft spent twenty six point or twenty six billion, was it? Yeah, on LinkedIn. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, Facebook is kind of dabbling in it, right? So, you know, what's your response to that? Just kind of keep your head down and uh, continue to uh, kick ass and take you're, names. Yeah. Or you're in that midst, like you can actually play. They don't yeah. even know our name or <laughs> yeah, but, 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 but it matters. What, uh, yeah. what it matters. On. But it matters. Well, I think the biggest thing for me platform, is right? just building the product in the community that only I and my team could yeah. build. Yeah. Um, so we always said we built this for our friends, our friends who are creatives and our friends who hire creatives. Yeah. And we talked to them like our friends on the site and we just do shit that like, and, and for a while I looked at Behance and I was like, ooh, Behance. And I was like, well, they couldn't do things the way that we do them. And so like, that's a good thing. And so really just embracing who we are and just doubling down on that and making sure we're staying true to our values and our voice and keeping that going. I'm so, pu I'm, so pumped that, I'm so pumped Google's doing it and we need to be scared. Yeah. Like it's, it's a good, like they're putting pressure, but uh, yeah, it's, it's. Do you find most freelancers will put a profile on multiple sites or do you find that they're loyal yeah, to? We, no, they should. Yeah, okay. You gotta make that money. <laughs> uh, what, do you, what, that money. what do you guys yeah. think of these guys coming into, your, like, into that world? I mean, so yeah, that's a good at this point in time, when you look for a job, it's hard and it's too hard. And all of the innovation in this industry is ahead of us. It's not behind us. And we need a lot of smart people around the world solving this problem. This is like one of the biggest markets in the world. It is one of the most important in terms of human impact. Yep. Um, and especially the farther away you go from the developed world, like the more impact that can be had and the more work there is to do. And so our expectation is all the platform players are gonna be here, you know, the ones that are here and more to come and that them and great startups and us all together need to do a lot of work to make things a lot better than they are today. Well, I feel it too, yeah. like you, and you, you both have been good to me. Like I'm the little guy in this story, but I feel like it, we can learn so much from it, right? And uh, you get an extra five minutes just because I say so. <laughs> we'll yes. I'm gonna, Cause I want, I want questions from the crowd, so. Are yeah. there any questions? I, have, uh, I wanna bring up autom automation. Um, yeah. you, there, a story, every week there's a story about robots are gonna take every job, yeah. everything he can like, be replaced by a robot. He likes to talk about sex robots. Um, <laughs> All right, this is over. Five minutes is over. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a whole other well, podcast yeah. uh, that I do. Anyway, um, for anyone out here that is, is in fear of their job being you know, replaced by a robot or, or, or you know, what advice would you give them to be sort of irreplaceable and what, uh, what, what should they prepare for in the next five, 10 years as more and more automation takes over corporate? Well, what is the, like world? it said, uh, I saw a recent thing, Jack Ma had a video out and it was like 800 million jobs that currently exist are gonna be automated in the next 15 years, 12 yeah. years, 12 yeah. years yeah. by 20. And, and computers are smarter than we are, period. So, yeah, so that yeah. means kids that are in kindergarten right now are gonna graduate into a world where these jobs don't exist they're predicting that the creative industry is gonna be the, one of the last ones to be dis, uh, disrupted. We need to be more human. We need to connect with each other. Uh, I was talking recently and Spanx would have never been invented by a robot. <laughs> they don't know what it's like to be insecure. They don't know what it's like to be self-conscious. Write that down. Airbnb <laughs> would not have been invented by a robot because you don't know what it's like to want to welcome someone into your home. Um, so I think we really need to think about what it is to be human 
and invest in that and, and push ourselves to, to really think about how we differentiate. They're talking about like advertising platforms where we're gonna put a bunch of images and a bunch of AI headlines and all that shit. Go for it. Yeah. Uh, because I, I, I can have a conversation with you and you and you and you and talk about our struggles, talk about our realities, talk about our fears that just robots aren't gonna be able to figure out. And so I think like we just need to double down on being human and the human experience and we're gonna still survive, we'll be fine. Cool, we got a question? Uh, yeah, so just working on the, the client side and a lot more common of us working with agencies and kind of just starting to work in the freelance world, how overall do, if you're using multiple different free freelancers, do you keep them motivated and morale high uh, to move forward, knowing you're giving them certain parts of work or not, not full work? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, we don't, uh, well, we don't work with that. I think freelancers are pretty hungry. <laughs> uh, how long have you been freelancing? I'm not no, freelancing. Oh, not. Clients, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, freelancers want to work and they want to do a good job. Now, sometimes I have to reprogram some friends that were divas uh, in their previous life, <laughs> that your job is to go in and be great to work with and solve problems and have a smile on your face. Um, some people that can't get over themselves and their ego gets in the way, don't Ooh. stick around very long. I, I consider freelance like a career purgatory. So if you were good in your previous life uh, and people wanted to wor work with you again, you will. But if you're an asshole, people are gonna decide not to work with you. Um, I, I don't think it's up to you to keep people motivated and interested. Um, I think you just give people assignments, give them opportunities, and if the fit isn't right, that's also cool. It's on to the next person to find the right person that's the right fit. Yeah, interesting work and community will attract anyone no matter what the structure yeah. of that relationship uh, is, and yeah. people wanna stay and be part of that. And I, I don't know what company you work for, but um, I literally am having like relapse to the two, early 2000s, like just try the internet. And I, these platforms, I, I, all our agencies that come on, we have big, big, big agencies and small agencies, and what we are close to clients, that's different, so it's a different uh, nuance there. But just try it, like yeah. I, I it, and you have to use it, you can't, so cheesy, but go to the gym and don't work out, nothing's <laughs> gonna happen. And probably nothing's gonna happen for two to three, four months of using the gym. But it's the same with platforms. Yeah. You gotta try it. And, and I you think, build your own network. I think people are afraid. I think people are afraid. I'm not sure engagement was your question, but keeping them engaged. And there are a lot of tools out there like Bonusly or 15 and 5. Yeah. Um, even Slack, like having a Slack group that you're always engaging with and making sure that people feel connected, I think is part of keeping freelancers engaged. Yeah, and, bringing and someone, if they feel like they're on an island, yeah. then yeah, they probably will leave pretty quickly. Question over there. Hi. First of all, I just want to say that I appreciated what you had to say about women and their career. So kudos to you guys. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was Sheryl Sandberg that said women's careers aren't like climbing the career ladder. It's more like a jungle gym. <laughs> um, so recognizing the need for flexibility as people transition through their lives is very key when it comes to maintaining the talent. Um, but the question that I had for you was with the recent publishing of the international ISO standards for human capital reporting. How do you foresee that affecting your platforms and HR in general? Hi, Paul. I can, <laughs> I, you know, I don't, I don't know enough about it to speak to it, so I, I, don't, I don't have I a don't, clear answer. Give us yeah, maybe some more insight know. on what, what's, the, what's the premise of it. So it was, I think it was published in November and it's the first of its kind. So it's a standard across the world for large and small companies. A lot of investors want more transparency because turnover um, can cost companies quite a lot yeah. because workforce costs can make up up to 70% of, yep. of a company's profit. So now with this reporting, there's going to be standardized measures and key indicators mm -hmm. across the world that would tell investors, yeah. yeah, this is a great company to work for. They've got a great workplace culture. People are happy there. People are more likely to produce and yeah. perform. Uh, we have to lean into that. Like it's that it's, it's a good point. We 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 need more of that, and uh, uh, it's cool. The people that come to the gathering, I think we we are all here. The brands that sponsor, the people that come, want to make the world a better place. So those types of reports that come out, I hope we don't run from them or say we can't figure it out. It's our job to fix it. Yeah, and it, you hold yourself accountable and your team's accountable, and th and there's things we can do with technology that adds transparency to that. Uh, but it's making that a priority as well. I think we're out of time. Any more, unless there are any more questions or you want to extend our there. period, Ryan. We'll do the la last one. Then we'll last one, Ryan. Ryan, says last Ryan one. you're gonna take my question? <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> Hi, Aaron. Hi. Um, I just wanted to respond uh, to the per 
person back there who said they're on the client side, and I wanted to ask you guys. Uh, so I've been a freelancer for years and years and years myself, and sometimes when I come into agencies, um, and, and the question was, you know, how do they work with freelancers best and all of that, and my experience is sometimes I'm not set up for success because the brief is bad, because they didn't tell me something in the brief changed, uh -huh. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, I'm, my head rolls first because I'm expendable. Yeah. Um, so that, unfortunately, sometimes happens. So I'm wondering if you have any plans or have thought about also, like, like giving, like, client-side tutorials. Yeah, com <laughs> companies don't, because the pla well. platforms are going to eat the world. I believe that. If companies don't treat people on those platforms, because they're, they're going to be probably your most close to the most talented people you have, because the greatest talent's gonna go out on their own, I think. Um, not always, it's a blanket statement, but you're gonna have to treat them better. <laughs> and yeah. th they're, gonna, they're gonna scream pretty loud, and I love the glass doors of the world. I hope we, platforms have that. Do you guys allow freelancers oh. to rate no. the employers? So we have, yeah. we, when someone takes a job, we say, hey, we're just finished working, give us like a star review, and then any feedback. Uh, we haven't done anything with that yet, but I don't want to publish that publicly because I feel like that's not really going to be helpful, but I want to give companies and freelancers performance reviews because sometimes you'll get, you'll, you won't get work as a freelancer and you have no idea why. So to have an understanding there and that's then amazing. also companies too, companies need to know why they're losing talent left or right. And if we have 10 freelancers that all said, yeah, they didn't really set me up for success in X, Y, and Z then I'd rather give that to the companies yeah, yeah. personally because then it gives them a benefit to improve as opposed to just publicly shaming them. If there's AI for that, that's a great idea. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, yeah. I think they're give, kicking us So real quick, if anybody wants to connect to you guys, Twitter handles, email addresses, where should they get in touch with you? Ryan Gill shares on all platforms. Just at Justin Genak or at WNotW. Paul Darcy, paulatindeed.com. Boom. Chat Follow their podcast. Awesome. Thanks yeah. to our panel. Thank you guys. Thanks, guys. <laughs>